Hello and welcome to another Play Better Chess video. So in this video, how to get better at chess now. Uh, it's a pretty big top uh, topic. How can you just improve your chess immediately? Uh, well, there's not really any you know, magic bullets or shortcuts that will immediately improve your chess. I guess the quickest way to improve your chess, or one of the quickest ways, uh, would be to just study a lot of tactics, you know, as much as you can about tactics, especially if you're a beginner. Now, once you improve and you get better at tactics and your chess level increases, uh, well, then you're going to have to study more, um, you know, strategy, end games, uh, openings, just everything. Uh, but for beginners out there, if you want to improve your chess now, you know, immediately, uh, do some puzzles and you know I would recommend maybe not doing just random puzzles um, without repeating them uh, so here's an example if you just do a thousand puzzles randomly you know and then you don't see those again you're probably not going to remember as much as if you would do those thousand puzzles and then go through them a second time with a quicker time limit. And, and I kind of covered this in a pattern recognition video that I put out yesterday. Uh, but you want to go through about seven times, uh, go through a series of chess puzzles with tactics and problems until you burn those tactics and patterns into your memory. So that's one of the quickest ways that you can improve your chess. You know, maybe start with something easier like uh, 20, 50, 100 chess tactics, and you want to pick easier ones. You don't want them to be too difficult uh, because then you would be working more on your calculation skills. Uh, but at first, you want to just improve your pattern recognition so you just see tactics and checkmates faster. But go through them once slowly, then go through them a second time faster, uh, and then each time you go through them, increase the or decrease the amount of time per problem. So maybe you give yourself five minutes, then three minutes, then two minutes, you know, until the seventh time you repeat through those problems, you're only giving yourself maybe 10 seconds, you know, 10 or 15 seconds to solve each problem and you're blasting through them. And by then you should be able to remember a lot of the patterns uh, and they'll be burned into your memory more and you'll recognize them a lot faster. Okay, so tactics. One of the best ways to improve your chess now. Uh, another way is to play regularly. Play, you know, daily chess if you can. Uh, a few games. You know, you could play Blitz, Bullet, and all that stuff, but I would probably, especially if you're more towards a beginner, focus on some slower games of at least 15 minutes or even 30 minutes or more. Uh, just longer games where you can take your time and think more. And then something that's important is to go over your game. Uh, you know, just go back over that game, look at it, look at all the moves and try and figure out what you did wrong uh, or what you did right so you can repeat it. Uh, and just try on your own to figure out what you did wrong especially and learn from that so you don't make that mistake again. And if there's something that you're not sure about, uh, then use a computer and hopefully the computer will help you and also point out things that you overlooked that you weren't able to figure out. Uh, now, another great way uh, to improve your chess now, instead of just going over your own games, you can also learn from the greatest players of all time. And today I have a game uh, featuring Bobby Fischer, one of the all-time greatest players. He was the world champion in 1972 uh, to 1975. And then he was supposed to have a rematch with Anatoly Karpov. Uh, but they could not agree to terms for that rematch. Uh, and Bobby Fischer said, well, I'm not going to play then. And he forfeited his title. And Karpov became the uh, world chess champion by forfeit. And then 20 years later, uh, I guess 
people in the chess world were trying to get Bobby Fischer to play either against Karpov or even Kasparov, who was the world champion in 1992. Uh, but you know, unfortunately, that did not happen. And so Bobby Fischer played against Boris Spassky, who was the world chess champion that he defeated in 1972. So they just had a rematch. And of course, Fischer ended up winning, uh, but this occurred in 1992, and we'll take a look at a game uh, from that world, uh, well, I guess it was an unofficial world title match. Uh, here it is. So, uh, and before we look at it, let me try and pull up the game review real quick and just see what level Fisher played at. So this is pretty amazing. Fisher played at a 96.7% accuracy rating uh, versus 87 by his opponent. Uh, Fisher had one brilliant move. Uh, he had one inaccuracy and one mistake, but his opponent had three inaccuracies. Uh, Fisher played at a 3,000 rating level. I don't know if you can see that underneath my image, so let me move that. So there, Fisher played at a 3,000 level, and I think his opponent played at a 2,400 level. Okay, uh, so what else occurred in that? In the opening, Fisher played with 100% accuracy, as did his opponent, but Fisher had a brilliant middle game with 95.4% accuracy versus only 82.3% by uh, his opponent, Boris Spassky, from Russia. All right, well, let's take a look here. We will put on the analysis and check this out. Now you can really learn and improve your chess quickly by going over these master games and try and uh, figure out. You could also try and, as you make the moves, pretend you're playing Bobby Fischer and try and guess what move he will make You know, before you look at the answer. Um, so, Fischer, I won't do that here, but you can, because you'll be able to see these moves. Uh, I'm just going to go through and see what Fisher did. So e4 is what Fisher played. He liked the e4 pawn opening, saying it was best by test because it allows the queen and bishop to develop quickly. e4 pawn openings usually open the game up more, giving more room for your pieces to maneuver through the center of the board. And his opponent plays c5, the Sicilian defense, a counter-attacking opening uh, that kind of slows down uh, this pawn push to d4 because then this pawn could capture. Uh, and if the queen captured, well, then the knight could chase that queen away, possibly. So the game continues with knight to c3, the closed Sicilian, which Fisher was not as famous for playing. He usually played an open Sicilian, uh, and maybe he was trying to surprise Boris Spassky here. So Boris Spassky develops a knight also, and now we have Fisher developing another knight. Uh, he does not bring it up here to f3 uh, because he wants to bring this second knight up so it can back up the first knight. So if the first knight jumps forward, the next knight could either jump in here. Uh, or, you know, the knight could cover an f4 pawn push. Maybe the knight wants to move here. Or the knight could uh, also reinforce this push of the pawn here. So, we have d6 being played. Uh, what does that do? Well, if this knight is moved forward, it prevents this pawn from harassing the knight. Uh, but at the moment, the knight is doing that as well with the pawn covering e5. So the game continues with d4. So what can you learn from these great players? Well, you notice that they haven't moved pieces twice in the opening. That's something you want to try not to do. You don't want to waste time by moving pieces around uh, more than once unless it's a you, unless you have to, or there's a good reason to do that. Uh, also, they're fighting for the center. Uh, these four squares in the center are the most important area on the board. 
Uh, except when the king is under attack somewhere else on the board, then that may be most important. Uh, so we finally have a capture in the center. So what does this do? Well, Fisher had two pawns on the important central squares. So Spassky gets rid of one of those. Now he moves that pawn twice in the opening, but he had a good reason. He didn't want the D pawn of whites pushing forward and chasing his knight. Uh, also, he knocks out one of the center pawns with a less valuable side pawn. And now Spassky has two center pawns. Fisher only has one. But Fisher does have more space in the center at the moment. So we have a recapture, keeping material even. So Fisher is forced to move a piece twice in the opening uh, to keep the material balance. So now e6 is played. Um, you know, a little more passive. It blocks in this bishop, uh, you know, preventing the bishop from moving. So now there's a bad bishop here. Uh, but it does cover a lot of squares uh, in the center with these two pawns here. And the game continues with Fisher just uh, continuing development, moving his bishop out to help fortify this knight. You know, maybe he wants to move his queen up here uh, and then castle on the queen side. So let's see what happens. Knight develops attacking this pawn. So now that is ignored uh, because the knight is doing a good job at the moment of covering that. Uh, and the game continues with bishop developing. Now this pawn moves up here to fortify the central pawn uh, and also to keep this square covered, preventing the knight from harassing the bishop. Uh, but this f3 pawn move can also help push this pawn forward. And maybe these pawns will march up the board and storm the king side uh, if black castles there. All right, so we have this move being played, uh, keeping the bishop and the knight, keeping everything out of this important square here on the queen side, uh, maybe getting ready to push forward and start a attack over here. So Fisher does castle there. His opponent castles on the opposite side. Uh, let me turn a light on. It's starting to get dark. Now, what can we learn from opposite side castling? How can you improve your chess now by learning uh, from what these great players do here? Well, in opposite side castling games, it's kind of a race. We see that now the pawns on each side can be thrown forward attacking the enemy kings. Uh, and you don't allow if the pieces, excuse me, if the king's castled on the same side, that would be more dangerous because you'd have to push pawns in front of your own king and it would create weaknesses as you push those pawns forward. There'd be holes in your defense. So we have a opposite side castling game and there will be a race to throw the pawns forward on both sides. And usually whoever can break through first uh, will have an advantage and you want to throw the pawns forward like Fisher does here. And then you use them as battering rams and funnel your pieces in behind them. So before Spassky counterattacks over here, he tries to trade off some of the attacking material. He gets rid of this knight. And that's another good strategy that you can learn from this game. We see that Spassky... His pawns aren't pushed as far forward as Fisher, so his position's a little bit more cramped. Now, with a cramped position like this, uh, you can trade off some of the pieces on the board, and then the remaining pieces on your cramped position will have uh, a little more breathing room and space to operate. And on the opposite side of that, if Fisher has all his pawns thrown forward and many of his pieces are traded off, well, then it'll be harder to cover all those pawns that are you know, way up the board. All right, recapture to keep material even. And then we have this pawn pushing forward. So Spassky begins his pawn storm on the opposite side here, aiming at Fisher's king. And now Fisher ignores that throwing his pawn forward first. 
So he's able to start attacking before Spassky. Uh, and the knight retreats. But Fisher has launched this pawn forward. Now there's a queen bishop battery attacking. Uh, so Fisher just throws another pawn forward, helping protect this pawn. Uh, and Spassky counterattacks. So what does Fisher do here? Well, he finds the best move. He places a knight on the edge of the board. And if you're familiar with the saying, the knight on the rim is dim, uh, that's because you don't want to put a knight on the edge of the board usually because it doesn't cover as much space. So here uh, we see the knight is only covering four squares. Now if we go back, when the knight was here, it's covering one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight squares. So it's twice as powerful when it's closer to the center. But this does kind of blockade the pawn storm that Spassky is starting to throw forward. So the bishop develops here. Uh, and what does Fisher do? Well, he moves a knight forward, sacrificing material, it looks like. And the computer says this is a brilliant move in this position. It looks like the knight can just capture. And then if the bishop captures, uh, well, then the queen can capture. So, you know, what is Fisher thinking here? Why is this such a brilliant move? And what will Spassky do about it? Well, apparently... Rook to b8 is the best move. Uh, knight capturing the knight here is the second best move. So let's see what happened. Spassky does find the best move. Uh, but before we go on, let's take a look at what would happen if we have this capture here. Well, after this, it looks like it would not be good to capture, uh, I guess because the queen could just retake, but the best move would be to capture on b4 with the queen, targeting the knight, uh, and then what should the knight do? If the knight drops back, well then the queen, uh, it looks like, could just pick off the bishop. So the best thing to do is to give that knight up uh, and the queen should ignore the knight instead of capturing that and go after the bishop here. All right, so back to what happened in the game. Spassky finds uh, the best move, although now it's saying it's the second best move, but no matter. Either way, Fisher has pulled ahead in this game and he has the advantage. So... Let's see what happens. The knight jumps forward here, uh, you know, capturing. So knight for knight, queen recaptures. Uh, and let's look at the position here. Uh, material is even. We have Fisher, you know, gaining more space here on the king side. Uh, he has both of his bishops, as does black. So they both have the bishop pair. Uh, but Fisher has not developed this bishop yet. Uh, so what does Fisher do here? He moves his king over to b1. Uh, so this is a common theme when a uh, when your player, your opponent, uh, or any player castles queenside. A lot of times they will move their king over to the b1 uh, or b8 square, especially if there's a half-open file here where a rook could line up on the king. All right, so, oh, and also the king does a job of covering this pawn as well. The queen tries to start fighting for the open or half open file here. Uh, another way to improve your chess now is to try and place your rooks on advantageous files. Uh, open files, half open files, or put them behind pawns you plan to throw forward. Uh, maybe like this H file where this pawn could march forward and attack the king in the future. Uh, but here, you know, maybe a rook on this half open file targeting the uh, white king here. So let's see what happens. 
Bishop to c8 is played, and this is an inaccuracy. Apparently a5 would have been better to just start throwing the pawns forward at Fisher's king, uh, but Fisher counters with an inaccuracy. He throws his pawn forward, but apparently that's not the best move uh, in this position. And it looks like b3 uh, would have been better to kind of block maybe this b pawn from moving forward in the future. Uh, let's see what happens. So now we have e5. Now this does attack the bishop here, forcing Fisher to retreat, uh, but it leaves a backward pawn here, which can be a weakness. Uh, you know, especially if these bishops were traded off, uh, or you know, if this bishop was knocked out, uh, and Fisher was able to keep his dark squared bishop. So let's see what happens here. We have the fish, or excuse me, the bishop retreats, helping protect this pawn, aiming at the king side. So Spassky develops his bishop to a better square, maybe with an idea of pushing this pawn forward and trying to uh, open things up a little more. Fisher lines up on the king here with his rook, and Spassky starts uh, commencing or continuing his pawn storm here, marching his pawns forward. Fisher does the same. So we have a race uh, with a pawn storm versus pawn storm. And Spassky ignores that in favor of repositioning his bishop, which is best, and helping to guard uh, this possibly vulnerable g7 square. So let's see what Fisher does. Fisher captures the best move in the position, opening up his rook uh, on the king here. Uh, and what does Spassky do? Well, this is an interesting strategy. He does not grab the free pawn because he decides to use that pawn uh, as a protective cover to prevent the other rook from attacking the king. So let's see how the game continues. Uh, here we have Fisher playing the best move once again, trying to trade off the dark squared bishops, uh, making it a little bit harder to defend this backwards pawn. So the queen helps defend the bishop. And now we have a mistake by Fisher here. So he should have played f4 to try and open things up even more uh, on his opponent. Uh, but maybe he wanted to double his rooks up or have that option of doubling either on the h file uh, or on the g file depending on what the situation calls for. So, exchanges of the dark squared bishops, and now the queen moves forward, but this is an inaccuracy. So, you know, what should Spassky have done? Apparently he should have pushed uh, this pawn forward, attacking the rook, uh, and maybe allowing his bishop to drop back if it needs to. Uh, I don't know, maybe to here, target this pawn or something like that. But uh, let's see uh, what actually happened in the game. So the queen has launched forward, uh, attacking an unprotected pawn here, uh, and Fisher ignores that, creating a battery of rooks. Lining up on this pawn, which is only protected by the queen. Uh, and what does Spassky do? Well, he goes after the pawn. Is this a poisoned pawn? Uh, and if you don't know what a poisoned pawn is, that's uh, any pawn that you go after and capture, but you really shouldn't because it could cause you problems when you're going after material when it would have been better uh, to play another move. Here it looks like a4 would have been better to just continue attacking, uh, you know, sending your pawn storm forward and try and get some counter play over here, especially maybe with the bishop lined up here. Uh, and it would not be good to go after this pawn because now the queen uh, is no longer guarding this. So what does Fisher do? He grabs that pawn, uh, creating an opening here 
Uh, and now the queen drops back, uh, but we have h6 here. So it's really looking dangerous for Spassky. Fisher is piling on the pressure here on this kingside attack. Uh, and finally, Spassky finds the best move, pushing forward, trying to get counterplay, but it's probably too late at this point. Uh, so Fisher, before continuing with his own attack, uh, he kind of tries to slow things down. He blunts the scope of the bishop, um, does you know, maybe give his king some breathing room, but you know, if this pawn pushes forward here, it would cover this, and the king would not be able to uh, hide on this square here. So, capture. We have a recapture towards the center, which is usually better than capturing away from the center. Uh, and now the rook moves over, lining up on the queen here. Uh, but, you know, rook to a8 would have been better. Moving over here, trying to grab the open file. Uh, maybe trying to get some kind of counterplay here, especially uh, with the queen lined up through here. If these pawns were able to uh, clear out. But Fisher. He starts attacking, tripling on the open G file. Uh, it's not looking good for Spassky. Uh, what is, and it's already a mate in 33. Uh, I doubt Fisher uh, you know, counted that far ahead, but who knows? Fisher is one of the greatest of all time. So the rook drops over here, uh, trying to reinforce this F pawn. And what does Fisher do? Uh, he presses forward, checking. The king captures here, which is best. Uh, and now we have a check. And the final move uh, after king to h8 is this h7 move. And this is where Spassky resigned. Uh, it looks like a mate in 14. Um, you know, how could the game continue here? Well, after h7... There's a threat of pushing the rook forward with check. Um, is that really a threat, though? It looks like that should not be played, uh, because then the king could capture here. Uh, well, it's still a threat, because if the king does that, you know, there's a possibility of moving here. Uh, and then the queen is going to have to block that. So you would be able to capture you know, the queen wherever it goes. So it, yeah, it's just looking really bad. And that's why Spassky resigned. Uh, so if we play the best moves, uh, it looks like queen to g6 is the best move. Uh, but then the rook would just capture the queen. So you know, for you beginners out there, you probably wouldn't dream of playing that move. Um, the other option could be queen to h6, uh, but then it's not looking too good. You know, maybe you have rook to g8 being played, um, and then that could lead to a mate up here on g8, which we'll take a look at. Um, bishop to g4 is another possibility, blocking with the bishop. All right, but let's say, um, I don't know. These are all looking pretty rough. Um, maybe try to attack in the center. Well, even that might be bad because of this right here, attacking the bishop. Um, so let's go back. Um Maybe the queen drops back to help cover the back rank. Then it looks like rook to h1 would be the best move here. Uh, so rook to h1. Uh, and it's a mate in four. The bishop could try and block. Um, yeah, it's looking pretty bad. Well, maybe... You try something like this, and it looks like that doesn't even work because of check. Um, 
Bishop checks. Oh, and then you have this discovered attack here. So, yeah, just a ruthless attack by Bobby Fischer. So, how to improve your chess now. Um, you know, study those tactics. Go over your own games. Go over master games like this uh, of the greatest players in history. You know, try to uh, cover the moves and guess what you think they'll play and see how many you get right. That can help you improve. Uh, study strategy study end games um you know study openings as well but especially if you're a lower rated player or if you're a beginner you don't want to focus too much time you know or all of your time on openings uh because there's a lot of other areas in chess you can really improve with especially tactics all right well feel free to leave any comments uh like and subscribe to support the channel thank you for watching and have a super chess day